Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Miller Martin. Uh, I'll be here chatting with my friend Tyler Miller and he's going to tell us a lot of things about Gadame. I hope so. <laughs> Hi Tyler, how are you? I'm good. It's, thank you for having me. Um, I really do appreciate it. Um, oh, my pleasure. Come on. <laughs> I don't know how much I'm going to be able to tell you about Gadamer because the reason I um, got into Gadamer and like specifically his aesthetics and his like the philosophical hermeneutics is because as an artist and someone who makes things, I'm very terrified about like the idea of like what good art is and what like what is relevant in art and, and Gadamer um, seems to sort of address that pretty directly in his aesthetic works. Like um, the relevance of the beautiful is probably the, the longest sustained essay on that. And that's probably what I'm going to be dri deriving a lot of what I'm going to be talking about uh, from that. And I've found that like very reassuring as like a, a poet, a potter, a cook about like what actually is relevant in art and how it sort of unifies um, with the rest of society, I guess. Yeah, uh, like I told you earlier, I never read him in that way. Mm -hmm. I know him only through the hermeneutics, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, he even says that hermeneutic is an art of being mm -hmm. able to listen. You know, mm -hmm. if you are able to listen, then you will be able to to view how other people wrote some of the books, mm -hmm. interpret those in your in the like in the truth way, you know. Mm -hmm. So I never read it as a stead guy. So you're gonna tell us here to begin with, who was he? Uh, well, Gadamer was a philosopher that sort of, I guess he was probably most profoundly influenced by, um, uh, like. Um, Heidegger and the existentialist tradition, but I, I would say like the philosophical hermeneutics is sort of his own thing. Um, I find it fascinating that he didn't really write a lot until much later in his career, partly because um, being a mid-century German philosopher, um, a world war got into the way, but it, it seems like he did a, a quite a great deal about like processing before he started writing. And his, his major work is um, truth and method. And a, a lot of his aesthetics, seem to sort of come from like the first half of truth and method where he's talking about um like the foundational concepts like bildung for instance and which um is like the process of acculturation and a lot of his discussion of play which comes into to relevance with um the, comes into um yeah relevance with with the, the relevance of the beautiful um is is talked about in truth and method and sort of the non-purposive aspects of it and so um his the philosophical philosophical hermeneutics is is grounded at, in the terminology of bible study which is where hermeneutics came from mm -hmm. um, in the 19th century and then he sort of extended that into like a, a way of interpreting uh other works philosophical works the world and things like that and i think there's a a pretty cool example in truth and method about how he talks about um the way like a, a trial judge and a defense lawyer or like a constitutional lawyer or something like that um would view the same law and they're both sort of right in their in their in, in their interpretation mm -hmm. and he makes like three critiques about ancient you know, i think um he's the main guy he is a plato for play, mm -hmm. we know that um, art is a lie. Yes, yeah. How does he respond to that? Um, well, he in in the relevance of the beautiful, um, what he talks about is um, he talks about that as like the first Plato's accusations that art is a lie is the first time that art had ever had to justify itself um as something like because he the mimetic theory of art that the greeks had um wasn't necessarily jiving with the new philosophical um claim to knowledge and so like you get um plato's io or ion for instance where um 
where you know Plato, like Socrates, is accuses Ion, the uh, the rhapsode, of not being able to to sort of justify his own his own words, and he talks about there being a truth, but it's a divinely and madly inspired uh, truth. And so, um, what I would say to that is like um, I, he doesn't really have a response, mm -hmm. except that he talks about like they say the Christian tradition and the way that art is grounded in the community and it grounds a consciousness outside of philosophy. And uh, the the problem that Gadamer talks about. Um, more is is that um like hegel's accusation that art is a thing of the past and so like you see art justifying itself religiously for instance in like the biblio paparum which is like the the illustrated bible where um f where people that couldn't read or didn't know latin could study the bible and he uses that as sort of a justification of art within itself and by the time you get to hegel in the 19th century that um that breaks down and that the artist is no longer that person the artist is no longer in the community and rather creates a community of his own and so um that would be i think like i think gadamer sort of takes takes it for granted that art isn't a lie and i think um he sort of he puts it in 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 terms of like you know there's plato's mimetic theory of art and that's what art is a lie comes from is the fact that mimesis can never fully represent what it's um what it is claiming to represent and can, can never really get a full truth of it and I, I don't think gadamer takes that as a um discounting because he speaks about art as um in heideggerian terms of being a concealing and revealing and so it, it conceals certain aspects and reveals them at different times and so i think what Gadamer is interested in and, and his response to what you ask about Plato is a, Plato's art is a lie is that um, it's it is but that's sort of not what what we we do with it 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 um, it, it it's a sort of an interplay between like the past and, and present and there's a, a sort of synthesis of a historical consciousness and a future consciousness I guess that's what I was going to ask that's a new concept that he brings to us i would like to understand mm -hmm. more about that uh, about which sorry the, that, the historical consciousness yeah um so he when um gadamer speaks about three different um classific three different aspects of art which is the the play the symbol and it's symbolic nature and it's festive nature and it's symbolic nature is really where he gets into the concept of a historical consciousness in that w when you you engage in a piece of art you're engaging in sort of an aspect of recognition um and that like that recognition it's it's not like oh i, I know this it's that it, it corresponds to something you already know and you interact with it as something you already know and so art's presence in that historical con consciousness like you can look at um art of the past and it exists in the past but it also exists in the present in, in sort of an organic is that answering your question at all or yeah you um, do. what okay. about aesthetic consciousness the present consciousness no aesthetic aesthetic consciousness okay so um well i guess like you're asking about like what would constitute beautiful then yeah and so um he talks a lot about hegelian sort of the sensuous um the sensuous representation of the idea which is a very like hegelian platonic idea yeah. that um that like and he t he talks about like the phaedrus and like the phaedrus is one of my favorite platonic dialogues because it's got this wonderful um discourse on how the beautiful sort of brings you closer to truth and it's the first thing that brings you back to the forms and reminds you of what was was there before and so gadamer talks about that and the fact that like beauty it it you can you can talk about the beauty of nature and he talks a lot about like kantian ideas of beauty um and then he um he talks about it in in sort of the sense that it it, it is a revelation of some kind of truth um i guess is that answering your question or <laughs> uh, yeah i think uh is a way of experiencing right 
Yes, yeah. Okay. So, in the next question will be, is the beauty located in the eye of the beholder? <laughs> or is all about like objective and objective feature with beautiful things? Well, I would say it's sort of placed in both. And really? uh, um, so what I would say is like, there's a couple of different ways of looking at that. And he talks about, um, first off, it's like art is kitsch, um, like bad art being simply like a correspondence to your previous experience. And um, you see that a lot in like popular culture where people want some a one-to-one -one correspondence about what's represented on screen or what's represented in, in, in a novel or what's represented in a painting as being a one-to-one -one correspondence to experience. Um, and that's that's represented with bad art in the sense that like, and then there's sort of the other opposite of that is that you, you are not interested in the art at all, but you're interested in like who's producing the art. Like, oh, you know, like Benicio del Toro's in this film or, you know, Callas is singing this area. Therefore, it must be good because this person is making it and you're not engaging in the work. And so beauty as like good art and transformative art um, comes about sort of as an interplay between the work and the person um, experiencing it. And he talks about how like, you can be disappointed when you go and see like the Notre Dame de Paris Cathedral, and you can be disappointed and it's like, oh, well, this isn't really as picturesque as I thought it would be, or disappointed when you see like the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, because it's it's like the size of a cereal box. It's not very big and it's not like very bright colors and things like that. But if you linger on the work, you can sort of see it's, it's um, internal logic and it's its own way of working. And so that, that gets into his concept of like um, play and this, the concept of t the festive time in the sense that art has its own time. And its ability to do that, I would say, is sort of um, is what creates it as good or beautiful art. Um, and, and so like if you can, if it successfully does that, then it would be good. And, and he makes a differentiation between like a diversion and sort of a transformative. Um, the German words are, it's, are, are escaping me. It's something like Erlebnung and Erfahrung or Erfahrung. Um, one being sort of like a diversion and the other being actually like a journey you go on that transforms you. And I would say that like the, the diversion one is very much about like that kitsch, that, um, that sort of um, one to one correspondence with experience, whereas good art, beautiful art, um, it, it it reflect it, it's both in the work and in the eye of the beholder, and it's it's kind of the the correspondence of the two, the symbolic aspect of art that um, is where the beauty lies. It's it's neither, but both, I guess. Okay. Um... I was reading a guy here who thinks that a Garamez unintentionally converts the truth about the art mm -hmm. into the truth content of the art. And that brings me to what Plato said, um, which aligns to what you were just saying. The fact that a, a drawing of a bed, it's just a drawing of the bed that I see over there. How, how he puts that? He says that art is an imitation of an imitation. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so this guy thinks that by Gadame trying to critique antiques, just like Plato, mm -hmm. is a big mistake. Would you agree with that? Trying to rehabilitate classical aesthetics is it a mistake? Um, I wouldn't say so just because I, I don't think he's, he is trying to rehabilitate classical aesthetics, but he's trying to answer the problem between art as past and art as, um, and a historical phenomenon and art as a present phenomenon that's very different okay. because we speak of both in the same, same language. It's just that one was an artist grounded in community where, um, the truth that was spoken about was in the community. And while you know, there's something to be said about Plato's um, saying that, you know, art is an imitation of an imitation because the real object is an imitation of the ideal form. Um, there's something also to be said about the fact that art presents, um, and this is m my own thoughts here, um, that art um, presents a, 
a, a sort of a mode of truth. And I think like maybe a more digestible truth because like what Plato's talking about with the forms, especially like post Parmenidean forms mm -hmm. is very much more like a mathematical function. Like, cause the, the, the challenge with the forms is that like um, something that is big um, like the, the third man argument comes up where you've got this bigness, big is bigness itself. And it takes a, if, if large things take, um, take a share of that, then there's always going to be something bigger than bigness itself. And so um, I think like you, you get into a non-representative format there and, and Plato's accusation, I've never actually found it to be that damning of art because even Plato in the 10th book of the Republic talks about mm -hmm. the role of, of, of art in, in society and the fact that, you know, there, there has to be good art to create good morals. And I think that, um, I don't know if, if, if does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. I agree with you. So mm -hmm. you want to tell us uh, a little bit about beauty and in Plotino, right? What's that? Plot Plotinus, yeah. So um, Plotinus, um, his work on beauty oh. is very much about like um, mm -hmm. it, it's Plotinus comes at the end of the Platonic tradition, and mm -hmm. so th there's an assumption on. Plotinus's part and most Neoplatonics uh, that like all of Plato is perfect, complete, and um, unified, which is demonstrably not true. But they, they've sort of created a philosophical system around that, um, and that sort of philosophical system attempts attempts to harmonize um, the aesthetics of of um, of Plato. Um, and, and in On Beauty, he, he talks about art as very much being a recognition, um, about beauty being an expression of the, the forms and ultimately the one, and that this um, beauty comes from a perfect unity. And um, even like other other philosophers talk about this, that there's it's, it's sort of that like ancient Greek idea of like harmony. And I, I, I regret that I didn't get to, to review more about Plotinus uh, today. Well, but, uh, what, but what would be the uh, essential relation? Is there any relation between art and beauty? And between art and beauty? Uh, yes. I, what I would say is that like beautiful art for Plotinus um, reflects certain divine proportions, reflects certain um, divine realities, and ultimately point, points us towards um, the forms and the one um, in that sense, because the, the Plotinian one and the, the three hypostases are the, the highest points that you um, you sort of reach. Okay, and uh, another question will be like, I know you, you sometimes you do your craft, if mm -hmm. I'm mistaken. So what would be considered as beauty, like as an art? Uh, how can you, is this? Well, so in my, in, a, in a, my, <laughs> in a mug for instance um yeah. well so like i find the crafts um really interesting because they're sort of like the last frontier of the hegelian art is past thing um and what i would say about that is that like craftsmanship um and like craft in general mm -hmm. resides in that that realm of still like the artist um, creating in the community and sort of like with making mugs, um, you can still have a mug um, that like is purely functional and has no decoration and is strictly um, engineered. Like you can go to Walmart and get a, a wonderful mug that's engineered. Mm -hmm. And what you find now is you get that sort of 19th century idea of like the artist creating um, their own community in what they make. And so the individual artist may um, makes a mug according to their aesthetic, and that aesthetic, um, what it does is it it um, it corresponds to the the artist's worldview, and presumably extends to an, the entire world as the artist interprets it. And so um, you get beauty in in that sense, in the sense that um, you are creating. Um, a new world for this person to inhabit and think about um, think about the 
the act of drinking from a mug in a pleasant, pleasant way. And you can do that either seamlessly or you can do that thoughtfully so that the person thinks about the, the piece of art. Someone I was speaking to about something like this says, you know, my favorite mug um, is one that's wobbly. It's got wood ash sort of on it. And so you have to handle it in a certain way. But what happens is that every time you use it, it becomes a ritual. It's like, it's like driving an old sports car. It's, it, you have to, um, like with an old sports car, like you, you, you don't get the synchro mesh on the clutch and you, you, you know, you, you have to drive it in a certain way and you have to think about that driving. And so you can get that thought and like with even food, like when you're, when you're cooking, um, like you can have food that directly one-to-one -one corresponds to your taste. And what that really is based in is who you were as a kid and what your mom served you and your grandma and stuff like that. And then you can have that same, same meal sort of turned on its head and i'm thinking of like you know noma el Bulli, um uh you know alanea in chicago where you are is uh like those restaurants what they do is they think about the act of food and how people culturally around them think about food and they turn that on its head so that um you start thinking about a meal like alanea like granted i remember out granted she did like a deconstructed steak sauce he had like a steak and then he had all the ingredients of like um a1 steak sauce sort of spread on the plate and as you mixed and combined them you could get the flavors of the a1 steak sauce but you could see how the steak sauce was actually const constructed and so you get that transformative aspect from the art you get that um the basis of beauty in your previous experience in a sense that you know like with a steak and a steak sauce you can think about exactly what that flavor is beforehand and then when it's presented to you in a deconstructed form you can you can sort of enjoy that as as a new thing um and i would say that that's sort of how i approach beauty in what i do is that like it's all about it's not about creating like an authentic authentic ingredient like um i i don't have a lot of interest in making food that is authentic to any one culture but i do have an interest in making food that is authentic to my experience in other cultures and so like i make chorizo but i don't make chorizo in spanish like I, the mold i use is different the the cultures i use are different um the like you know i i make i made a brie cheese that was processed cheese in the center just because like you know that the, my favorite sandwich cheese is, is is you know like american sliced singles because they're kind of good on <laughs> on a grilled cheese and i kind of wanted that that taste and that texture um in like a fancier cheese to say no like this is a legitimate cheese product um because it is and and so like that's how i would have view art and and like whether or not my art in any aspect is successful is the fact that um it 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 it's based in my paradigm and other people can sort of enter into that sort of interpretive world of mine and then i kind of spell out what my paradigm is within that and so like when i'm making a mug um i tend to make them sort of within like a paradigm of like i i made like a bunch of stuff i used to joke was like gas station sushi like it was like japanese but it was like my understanding of japanese stuff and I, like i remember like you know like um akira kurosawa's like samurai films you know like there's a lot of beautiful like warring states period pottery in there and like a lot of really stunning classical pottery in those films um and that's how i know Japanese culture and so like I I'd play with those forms and I play with those raises. You never you never been there. No, I've never been to Japan. No. Really? <laughs> yeah, no, I but like that's my understanding of the culture is from like sam old samurai films and like those I grew up with those samurai films. They're as much a part of my culture as they are to anyone in Japan because like I started watching them when I was 10 years old. And like, you know, um the to Shiro Mifune, like he's in most of those and he plays this sort of deep voiced samurai guy like that. I, I love that stuff. Like mm -hmm. Seven Samurai was one of my favorite movies as a kid. And I, I knew about that before Magnificent Seven. So like that and like, you know, Hidden Fortress is Star Wars. Like if you've watched Star, the Star Wars A New Hope, you've seen a Hidden, for Hidden Fortress. Um, and so like that, that is part of my culture as, as who I am. But it's not the same and i would never be interested in making it the same as what's actually in japan like my my pots are um what i sort of grew up with and experienced and so if it's 
I use aspects of that culture, but it's it's how I've experienced that culture. I think like, and I think that like everyone has that where like no matter where in the world you are, you know who Michael Jackson is, you know who McDonald's are, you don't necessarily know anything about American culture or American like R and B, but you know who they are and you know what their music is and you have a relationship to that, irrespective of anything else. Will that be will I be correct if I say that art communicates emotions? Absolutely. And more so I would say than even words. And I would say that art is um emotionally um grounded in the sense because and I think like like it it, it works more with a human mind than it does than does say like a mathematical function, even though the mathematical function is more accurate or like a scientific study is more accurate to what it does. The way our mind works is we work in stories and feelings and things like that. Yeah. And so um, like if you read a poem, what what's most important about a poem is when you read it out loud, how it makes you feel. And the words don't have to make sense. The words just have to make you feel something like and that's what music is about like absolute music that doesn't have any words like it it plays on the way that we interpret tone based on human speech and that's the the, the whole point of it is that we experience it um emotionally before we spirit ever experience it intellectually and so art it it's sort of that internal logic of emotions mm -hmm. and it, it corresponds to stories we tell about ourselves and experiences in that Gadamerian symbolic way, um, but it also um, it it tells a story with that in a new way, and that that's what good successful art is about: is it tells a story with what it does, um, and it tells a story like with your emotions in and in that symbolic way of Gadamer, it has to correspond to previous emotions, experiences, and stories. And everybody in the audience is gonna have some sort of share of that. And if the artwork is successful, then it sort of unifies the audience in a, a single way. Like everybody in the theater, they see the same performance, they come to the theater with mostly the same experiences. And that that's how art works. And that's how art communicates is that everybody, it, it corresponds symbolically to something that everybody in the audience has for it to make sense. And like, if somebody's like, well, I don't get this, it's because they maybe didn't get the specific references that were there. Mm -hmm. But if you do have those specific references, it functions and it unifies everybody to feel the same thing and to, to think about it in the same time. And it sort of washes all over them all in the same way. You start to agree that the earth is in the eye. <laughs> yeah okay okay tyler it's been 28 minutes uh mm -hmm. let it go last words if you have um well i'd like to thank you again for asking me to do this this was a lot of fun and it was a, it was a good challenge to, to sort of answer your questions i mean there's nothing harder than, than uh you have any questions <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> no they're fantastic and, and there's nothing harder than answering um difficult genuinely thoughtful questions um and and actually learning something yourself about what you're you're answering because it's not until like another person presents a way of thinking about it that you actually get to really see what you think about it and so i'm, I'm really grateful for that thank you very much for for talking to me and and, and asking me to do this it's, it's, it's been a real pleasure oh thank you and that was it oh okay i'll let you go and all right how was it? It's been 30 minutes now. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate we'll talk, it. talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.